2023, there was this slow awakening happening with me around this subject. There was no single event, uh, but there were these reminders and nudges all over that we have a responsibility as interior designers and a role to do better in this world. The world of interior designers needs leaders like you and me who will be vocal with clients and with the brands that we work with and with the vendors that we source from and letting them know that this is important and that we have a responsibility. Welcome to the Designers Oasis podcast. I'm your host, Kate Bendewald. If you're tired of one size fits all advice to running your interior design business, you're in the right place. Join me each week as we dive into topics to help you run a thriving interior design business without the hustle. We'll talk about the business of design, but also mindset and mental health, because I know when you thrive, so will your life and business. It wasn't that long ago that I stepped away from my corporate interior design job to build my own design business so that I could realize my own creative dreams, have more time with the people I love, and serve my clients at the highest level while making more money than I ever could have working for someone else. It wasn't always easy, and I made my share of mistakes along the way. Fast forward to today, and I've learned a thing or two. Since then, I've built multiple six-figure interior design businesses on authentic word-of-mouth referrals with many repeat clients. And I want to share it all with you, the ambitious, inspired, and I get it, occasionally overwhelmed interior designer who shares this dream of transforming lives through the art of interior design. You can do this. Thank you for letting me spend part of this day with you. Let's get to it. Hey there, I want to interrupt this episode for a very exciting announcement. Let's be honest, when you're preparing client proposals, you're probably asking yourself the same question that thousands of other designers are asking themselves. Questions like, what do other designers charge? How much would a designer at my experience level charge for a project like this? How long should it take to do X, Y, or Z? If you're like most designer, these are questions you ask yourself often. The problem is these aren't easy questions to answer. An experienced designer is going to charge differently and likely be much faster at their job than someone who's in their early stages of business. But we're on a mission to bring clarity and insights to these exact questions. And that's where you come in. For the month of February, we're launching a massive survey to interior designers like you in order to gather vital information related to how designers price their services. In the end, we'll share our findings with a thorough and detailed report, beautifully designed, of course, so you can see what designers at your level typically charge and how long it takes them to do certain aspects of their job. Our goal is to give you insightful data points so you can more confidently price your services and estimate your time. If you want a free copy of the report, you'll need to participate in the survey. To do that, head over to designersoasis.com forward slash survey today. Again, that's designersoasis.com forward slash survey. And we'll be sure to link this in the show notes. So if you're not able to uh, go there right now, just know we've got that available for you. Here's the thing though, the more designers who take the survey, the better data we'll have to share with you. So as soon as you're done taking the survey, my hope is that you will share it with an interior design friend of yours. Now, if you're catching this episode after the survey closes, don't worry. You can still get access to the survey results at the same webpage, designersoasis.com forward slash survey. Now, before I go, I want to mention that we take your privacy very seriously. All survey results are anonymous and none of your personal information will be shared. You can find more information and FAQs on the webpage. Again, that's designersoasis.com forward slash survey. Your participation is so helpful in contributing to the betterment of the interior design business industry and design business owners everywhere. Thank you so much for your participation. Now back to the show. 
Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm thrilled to be sitting and hanging out with you all today. If you listened to last week's episode, you'll uh, I sort of gave a sneak peek of what's to come in 2024. And one of the things I mentioned was that I wanted to focus some of the conversations that we're having here uh, on the podcast around sustainability and interior design. We have a huge, huge, huge opportunity in this world to, to have an impact on the environment and the way that we source and the way that we design. And so today we are just going to scratch the surface of this conversation and hopefully you'll walk away feeling inspired, motivated, educated, curious, uh, and all of those wonderful things. This is definitely not, although I, I am going to share some statistics that might make your hair raise. This is not a doomsday place. We're not, uh, it's important for us to be clear, right? And to understand what's really happening. But uh, my goal is never to have anyone walk away feeling like they need to just throw their hands up in the air. We're all going to hell in a handbasket because we're not. <laughs> well, at least not yet. So uh, we're going to get into it. But before we do, just a couple of quick announcements. Don't forget that we do have the interior design fees survey, which you can learn more about um, at designersoasis.com forward slash survey. We are launching a huge nationwide survey asking interior designers about their business and the way that they charge. Uh, everything is anonymized and we are going to present these survey findings to you in a uh, detailed report. That's the goal. And you can learn more about the purpose and how it works. And if you participate in the survey, uh, you will get a copy of the report for free. Uh, the report will be for sale. The survey is open only for the month of February. So make sure you head over and you uh, contribute to the survey. We really want to hear from you. Um, and we want to be able to put together this really robust report for all interior designers. Uh, and if you, again, complete the survey, then you'll get a copy of that for free. All right, so uh, look for the link to that in the show notes. Don't forget that our Dear Kate segment is live. So if you've got uh, design or business related questions that you want me to answer on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. So send me an email at designersoasis.com forward slash forward slash <laughs> dear Kate. Again, all the links will be in the show notes for you to find, but uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Okay. I think that's all of the announcements. Let's get to it. So I first want to share with you a little bit about my own personal history with sustainability and design, because I'll be honest, I kind of lost my way. Uh, in 2008, 2009, I was near graduation from college, uh, getting my degree in interior design. And at the time, I was all about sustainability. I was especially moved and motivated by a course that I took called Housing and the Environment, where we covered a lot of these subjects and we learned a lot about um materials that were um, environmentally uh, sus sustainab sustainably, it, it just depended on what it was, but they were all green eco materials. And I was all about it. I took my, I became a lead green associate. I took uh, that, that exam. Um, I got a job. I was working at the U.S. Green Building Council, the Colorado chapter. And my first job um, out of college really was this, I was a lead project manager. So if you're not familiar with lead, L-E-E-D, uh, it's leadership in energy and environmental design. Holy smokes, I am out of practice. I would have to fact check that, but it's something like that. And it's a, the lead certification is something that is used for the built environment to uh, indicate its level of sustainability. And there's all these different metrics. But anyway, my first job was at as architecture prior to moving into the design, uh, interior design department, I started out as a project manager for all of our projects that were uh, sort of searching for or were seeking lead certification. Uh, so it was a lot of paperwork, but I learned a ton. And I was immersed in that world of sustainability in the built environment. And I was quite savvy and it was very important to me. But I'll be honest, along the way, I lost, I lost my way. When I left commercial design and I went into the residential field, it really wasn't an important thing to my clients and therefore it didn't it wasn't important to me. And I certainly wasn't working with the biggest budgets when I first started out. And so 
you know, s- sourcing inexpensive and, and I'll be honest, cheap furnishings at the time really wasn't the path or the way to smart and sustainable choices. So I look back over my career and I think to myself, man, there were a lot of missed opportunities. There were some things that I did really well, right? Um, but and, I, and I'm proud of those, but I think back and I'm like, man, I really wish I had I had done more. And so my goal is to just start today where I am and to really put this back into focus, not only for myself, but for, for you guys here um, in this community. So, you know, I, th- I feel like in 2023, there was this slow awakening happening with me around this subject. There was no single event Uh, But there were these reminders and nudges all over that we have a responsibility as interior designers and a role to do better in this world. The world of interior designers needs leaders like you and me who will be vocal with clients and with the brands that we work with and with the vendors that we source from and letting them know that this is important uh, and that we have a responsibility. So with that in mind, I want to share with you some figures and some research. And we've got links to all of this and the sources. So if you want to come learn more, you can find those in the show notes. But I want to share just the impact, especially around fast furnishings and its impact on the environment. You are most likely familiar with the term fast fashion, which is the term used to describe mass produce the industrial the industrial production of uh, f- fashion, which as if anybody's ro- watched Project Runway, which our family still does religiously, you know that one day you're in and one day you're out. And that same concept of fast fashion has now translated into fast furniture, which is mass produced, quickly and cheaply made furnishings that have a very short shelf life and end up in the in the landfill very quickly. And so there's a lot of ways that we can look at our role as interior designers and our and the impact that we have on the environment, but fast furnishings is one of one of the really big one big ones. It is having a catastrophic impact on the environment. And as we all know, the alarm bells are ringing. So let's start with waste. I'm hoping that this uh, survey gets updated because it looks like the, the EPA was doing this about every five years. But these figures are from 2018. So we're coming up on nearly the five-year mark. Um, and I'd be very curious to know where this is today. But in 2018, in the US alone, we put 9.68 million tons of furnishings in the landfill. Now that was just for 2008, excuse me, 18. And that was just for the U.S. That doesn't take into consideration all of the years before that, after that, or anywhere else outside of the U.S. 9.68 million tons of furnishings went to the landfill. 2.5 million tons of rugs and carpeting went to the landfill. And 2 million tons of appliances went into the landfill. Uh, Look, I get it. I understand that there are some things that just are at the end of their life and there's not much else you can do with it. But I want us to consider these figures and ask ourselves, hmm, what can we be doing better? Let's talk about greenhouse gases for a minute. A recent report published suggested that the average piece of furniture generates up to 47 kilograms of carbon dioxide or the equivalent of about... of the equivalent of burning 5.3 gallons of gasoline. So the average piece of furniture uses as much carbon dioxide, generates as much carbon dioxide as burning 5.3 gallons of gasoline. Industrial scale deforestation is another huge impact that the furniture industry is uh, contributing towards. I learned this recently, but most, so well, I didn't learn this. I knew this. Most fast furniture is made in China, right? We we kind of knew that. But here's what I learned recently was that China cut down all of their forest by 1990. So today it imports all of its wood from Russia, Africa, and the US in order to make the furniture that they then send back to those countries. 
but mostly the U.S., right? So we're harvesting wood at an industrial scale without uh, replanting in a sustainable way. We're, we're cutting down all of these forests, sending all of that wood to China to make the furniture that we're then sending back to the U.S., not to mention on these massive shipping barges that need a ton of fuel to get there and back, right? Deforestation affects us all. People and animals lose their habitats. The soil erodes. It causes mudslides. The air gets drier and the earth gets hotter. This is a fact. Let's talk about child labor and unfair labor practices. This is especially prevalent in the rug and the textile manufacturing industries. Child labor affects 160 million children worldwide, and these children have the highest illiteracy rates in the world. Ooh, okay, let's take a beat because those are some staggering figures, right? This is This is stuff that I wish wasn't true, but it is. So what can we do? I'm going to share with you just a few strategies that you can employ in your interior design business to source sustainably. But before I get into it, I want to let you know that I do have a free PDF that you can download. Uh, it's a sustainability guide for interior designers. It's a free downloadable and printable guide to help you source more sustainably. And inside, I, it's going to include uh, key principles of sustainable interiors, terms to know, eco labels and certifications to look for. Plus, I'm including 10 of my favorite brands that are dedicated to sustainability. Uh, these are brands in furniture, tile, uh, fabrics, all of it. So uh, to get your guide, just look for the link in the show notes. Okay, so let's go back and talk about what are these key principles of sustainable interior design? What can we be doing? I, I just want to say this. This is not an all-encompassing list that this would take, I could spend my entire life talking about this. So really what I mentioned at the beginning is true. We are just scratching the surface today, but I'm hoping that you get a whole lot of value out of uh, some of these principles. And I also want you to keep in mind that it's not like you have to reinvent everything that you already do in the way that you already do it, even if you're just making small moves in the right direction, right? If we all just pivoted just a little bit to start to make smarter, wiser, thoughtful, conscientious choices in this area, we can have a, a, dis, a huge improvement. Now, I'm personally hoping that this is motivating to make some really big changes in the way that we source and the way that we design. Um, but the important thing is that you do your best, right? Um, we can't always do everything that we want every single time. I get that. I live in the real world. I have clients. I know what's realistic. But when you start to pay attention to these kinds of things, and it becomes a lot easier to ask the right questions and look for the right things. So without further ado, here we go. So the first way is specifying environmentally friendly materials. Uh, it's going to be an important part of your job to research and select sustainable materials and products. And in my guide, I'm going to give you a list of a few of my favorites, but there are so many more. Um, thinking about textiles, textiles use a ton of energy, water, and heavy metals to produce, not to mention the agricultural effects of fertilizer and pesticides used on industrial crops. So things like looking for organic cotton, uh, linen, and wool material are better options. Uh, materials like cork. Cork is an infinitely renewable resource that comes from the bark of cork trees uh, that are primarily grown in Portugal. Uh, it's really neat if you could uh, do a quick Google search to see how they harvest this. It's, it's beautiful. But they cut off the outer ring. Uh, which is the cork layer, and then it grows a new layer um, after that in a very short amount of time. So the cork materials can be used to make all kinds of things. Uh, obviously, one of the first things that comes to mind is cork for wine bottles, right? But cork is used to make things like wall coverings, uh, which, by the way, has very good acoustic properties. It's great for offices and bedrooms, uh, but also upholstery material and flooring. Our first home, we had a small kitchen and we did cork flooring that was stained black and white and we did black and white stripes. and It was very striking. I really loved it. But knowing that that was um, a cork material made me feel really good. But it um, my point is cork doesn't always have to look like what may pop into mind immediately. There's this cork fabric that has some gold striations through it uh, that I think is really beautiful and it can be used on uh, furnishings and that sort of thing. So uh, there are 
so many sources and resources available out there for you. Those are just a couple of examples. The next way is reducing the use of raw materials. One of the most obvious ways that you can do this is to source vintage and antique items. Now, that personally gets me very, very excited because that's the world that I love so much. But sourcing vintage and antique reduces the need for uh, new newly manufactured products. Uh, buying gently used or secondhand items, I have a fun to me habit of scrolling on Facebook Marketplace and you would not believe the cool shit that I find on there all the time. And so often I'm like, oh my God, where could I use this? Can I just go buy this? I don't have a place for it or a client who needs it, but I want it so bad. So it's really the thrill of the hunt. You have to, and and for me, that's fun. Um, I've got a couple of friends that's fun for too. And uh, maybe it's fun for you. Yes, you have to weed through some stuff, but you can really use your key search terms to use Facebook Marketplace to hone in on really beautiful um, antique vintage pieces and gently used pieces. We bought a pair of chairs from Facebook Marketplace that we're getting ready to reupholster and they were just the perfect size and silhouette. We love them so much, but they're uh, the, the current upholstery is really um, in desperate need of being replaced. So we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, Look at your local consignment stores. Look, uh, there is a Facebook group called the Interior Design Resale Group. That is another really great resource for you. Again, I'll link to this um, in the in the show notes. Another option is look at app. Uh, architectural salvage yards. I love going to an architectural salvage yard. You can find beautiful hardware, doors, windows, fireplace mantles, all kinds of fun stuff. And those things can look really beautiful in both modern homes as well as um, in more traditional homes as well. Those are a couple of ways, but I want to answer the burning question that I know is probably going through your mind, which is, how am I supposed to make money on products that I'm sourcing from Facebook Marketplace? <laughs> well, my answer to you is yes, friend, you should be doing a markup on any one of a kind items that you source. Uh, that is something that is in my contract and that I think you should include in your contract and um, include in your business practice that vintage, antique, and one of a kind items that you source will have whatever markup. Now, I don't I'm not going to get into all of this, but I don't necessarily share markup amounts with my clients. It, it doesn't work that way, but um, you can choose how to phrase it, how you want to phrase it for your business. But I don't think there's anything wrong with putting a markup on one of a kind items that you source. So let's just get that objection out of the way. Hey designer, are you tired of wasting precious time with prospective clients who are not a right fit? Do you experience imposter syndrome because you know the back end of your business is kind of a hot mess? Perhaps you're experiencing growing pains and you don't have the tools, resources, or team to support you. I get it. I've been there. As an ambitious interior design business owner myself, I know the roller coaster ride this can be. Over the years, I've learned a thing or two about running a profitable word of mouth design business, and I want to help you find success too. How would it feel to wake up and face the day knowing exactly what to focus on next, having a roster of enthusiastic clients, including a paid wait list, and having the space, time, and creative energy to develop projects that you are proud of and are portfolio, if not press worthy? I want to invite you to learn more about the Interior Designers Business Blueprint, a business coaching program designed exclusively for interior designers who want to serve their clients at the highest level while making good money, but without the burnout and overwhelm. If you're ready to get off the roller coaster, you don't have to do it alone. Join me inside the Interior Designers Business Blueprint and get the tools, teaching, and community you need to pave the way for an interior design business your clients love and you are proud of. To learn more, grab the link on your audio player or head to designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. That's designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. All right. Number three is to source quality. 
It is our responsibility as interior designers to educate clients on how furniture is made, what is going to last longer and stand the test of time. Okay, so thinking about furnishings and how it's made, here are a couple of things that I want you to be thinking about, looking for, asking your reps and vendors about. Uh, First is the suspension system. So that's what's under the cushions, right? It's what's below the fabric, below the bat material, and below the foam is the suspension system. And there's two, there, there's, there are several ways that this is, that the suspension systems can be made, but two of the most common um, are the eight-way hand tied, which is really the gold standard of fine furnishings, um, versus sinuous springs. Sinuous springs is one of the most common way that you'll find those uh, uh, made, but there there are others. But uh, an eight-way hand tied suspension system has long been considered the gold standard because it is going to last the longest. Um, and it it is what it sounds like. You can you can do a Google search and learn more about how that works, but um, it really does help it, the integrity of that cushion last for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I know the furniture that was in my grandmother's house. She sourced quality furnishings. Um, I know that because I know her Uh, But I also know that the furniture that she had in her home continues to live on in the homes of my family, myself included. Um, Back then, that's all there was. And I mean, there's horse hair too, but that's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) um, But the eight-way hand tied was the only way that uh, furniture was made back then, uh, to my knowledge. Um, But as they started to produce more furnishings, uh, more mass mass produced furnishings then they had to come up with more cost effective ways to um, put it together and so that's where they started to develop these other methods such as sinuous springs but AOA hand tied is still used uh, in um, furnishings today so find out what's in the upholstery that you are sourcing thinking about framing are they using hardwood hardwood versus softwood is it sourced from sustainably managed forest think about the joint construction is it single or double dowels do they have blocking are they using mortise and tenon construction and then obviously we can't talk about furnishings without talking about upholstery fabric um things like what is the light fat fastness is it going to fade in the sun how does it clean does it repel liquids uh, so these are the kinds of things that you want to evaluate furnishings for when you're making your selections. So yes, quality does cost more. Um, But when you help your clients buy the best that they can, you educate them on the differences, uh, on how long these, these items should last, and remind them that you are there, you're their partner to help them make smart choices so that they can feel good about that. And that those extra costs, and then those extra costs really start to make sense and it's no longer an objection because we realize that the cost is not just in the the dollar figure, but there's a lot more um, buried in that cost um, when it comes to how things are made uh, and who was involved in the making of these pieces of furniture. I just want to take a quick moment and give a shout out to one of my personal favorite brands. This is not a promotional moment. They're not uh, affiliates. They are not sponsoring this episode, but it's a company that I have sourced from from a really for a really long time because I love their dedication to sustainability. And that's Lee Industries. Lee Industries is a true leader in the world of style forward, sustainably designed furnishings uh, to the trade. So check out their website to learn more. That's um, one of my favorite go-tos for, for well-designed handcrafted upholstery. Moving on, improving indoor air quality. So even after an installation, a project's furnishings and finishes can emit toxic toxic gases into the air for months, even years, through a process called off-gassing. This is not something that you can avoid entirely, if I'm being honest, but you can minimize and reduce off-gassing in a number of ways. First of all, looking closely at the kinds of paints and adhesives and materials that you're specifying and looking for paints that have no VOCs. So VOC stands for volatile organic compounds, and that is the stinky stuff that you smell when you walk into a freshly painted room. Uh, But there are so many um, 
paint companies that offer uh, no VOC paint options that are still durable and will last. You do not have to sacrifice that uh, to get a no VOC paint options. Opting for natural rugs and carpeting such as wool or jute is another way that you can improve indoor air quality. Avoiding vinyl products whenever you can. Um, so in the PDF guide that I'm going to share with you. I'm going to give you a list of labels to look for, uh, a list of certifications to look for, but two of them are Green Guard and Floor Score uh, that have to do with indoor air quality. So especially when you're looking at things like flooring materials, you can look for those certifications to know um, that they have been indep independently verified um, as uh, not having a negative effect on indoor air quality. So again, get the guide and you'll have more information for all of those. Next, we have water reduction or reduce water use. Uh, there's a term called hidden water, which is essentially saying that it may not be visible, but millions of gallons of water go into manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing of consumer goods, of just about everything we touch, including paper, plastic, metal, textiles, and, and beyond. Fun fact, a typical cotton bed sheet has a water footprint of 2,576 gallons of water. It, one typical bed sheet uses 2,500 gallons of water. That is banana cakes. All right, so anytime we can reduce the demand for consumer goods, such as reupholstering, a well piece of furniture, that's always a better choice. Obviously, sheets wear out, and sometimes you need a fresh pair of sheets. I, I personally love getting a fresh pair of new sheets, and I love sourcing really good sheets. But here's the thing. Think about when you're sourcing bedding, for example, not only looking for organic cotton, organic materials, but also thinking about how long is this pair of sheets going to last, right? You look at the price tag of a $500 pair of sheets and you think to yourself, I don't know who the fuck is buying that, but it's not me. I want you to think to yourself, well, wait a second, but if I have this pair of sheets that cost what seems like an arm and a leg, but it's going to last, I don't know, a lifetime, I would maybe reconsider spending that kind of money on a pair of sheets. So um, think about water, hidden water. Think about the water footprint of the materials that we're using. And just consider that when you're making your specifications. Um, again, reducing water use back to opting for vintage and antiques. It, that's making a huge impact. Um, plumbing fixtures is another very obvious way that we can uh, specify items that are reducing water use. So selecting water efficient appliances, such as dishwashers, washing machines, and toilets. Uh, look for plumbing fixtures that have the water sense label. So the water sense label, again, that's going to be in the guide that I share with you. Um, you know, I want to I want to acknowledge that if you're what if you're looking at a faucet for a bathroom sink, right, you can reduce how much water is coming out of that faucet per minute and still effectively wash your hands. Uh, but a pot filler, on the other hand, you just need the water and you need it fast, right? So you're most likely not going to find a pot filler that has that water sense label, but you can look for it in things like shower heads, um, hand washing faucets, sink faucets um, that can still get good pressure, but with you, I can't talk, but with using less water. Um, so again, look for that water sense label when sourcing your plumbing fixtures. And the last one on my list today, and this is one, again, that we could go into so much depth over, but we're just going to scratch the surface today. And that is thinking about sourcing ethically um, in terms of social responsibility. So asking where items are made, what are the factory conditions, opting for made in the U.S. is always a good option. And, you know, looking at the items that we're making, that we're ordering and that we're specifying, where are they being made? What are those factory conditions like? Ask your vendors, ask the people, ask your manufacturers, the ones who should know. And if they don't have a good answer for you, then that's most likely a red flag. But we need to be asking these questions. Um, why ever buy mass-produced art again when there's an endless opportunity to support emerging artists that allow you to find unique and one-of-a-kind pieces of art affordably, right? So... 
this is contributing to our local social economy, to our local economy, um, looking for artists that are supporting BIPOC, LGBTQ um, artists is another way that you can really have an impact um, through the social responsibility lens. Just to recap, I'm going to go back through these again. We have specifying eco-friendly materials, reducing the use uh, and, and need for raw materials, sourcing quality, uh, improving indoor air quality, reducing water use, and sourcing ethically and with uh, social responsibility in focus. Guys, we have more work to do. There's so much more to talk about, and we'll probably address it in a future episode. But you know, I want to talk about communicating sustainability to clients. How do we effectively convey the value of sustainable design uh, for their home, for their health, and quite frankly, for their karma, <laughs> for our karma? Um, how do we address client concerns and misconceptions, right? Sometimes we think that we have to give something up to have an environmentally friendly um, product or material. And uh, that's not always the case. Uh, in fact, it's usually not the case. Um, we need to talk about communicating to suppliers and manufacturers. How do we identify and partner with eco-friendly suppliers? How do we um, create demand for sustainable products? Just this week, um, as an example, I was on the Laloy website. Uh, nothing wrong with Laloy. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying anything bad about them as a manu as as a vendor. Uh, we source from them all the time. They sell. I mentioned earlier that the rug industry is one of the worst industries uh, to use child labor. And there is, uh, speaking of certifications, there is a certification called Goodweave, which certifies rugs uh, that they were made social, with social responsibility in mind. So again, more on that in the PDF guide that I'm going to provide for you. So Laloy has many, many, many rugs that have the Goodweave certification, but currently that is not a filter option when searching for rugs. So if I was specifically looking for a Goodweave certified rug, if you go to Laloy's website, you will not see that as a filter. So I'm saying, what if we all emailed Laloy, and I'm going to email Laloy myself and ask, and other rug manufacturers, not just Laloy, because they're not alone in this, and ask them to create a, a simple filter so that when you're looking for rugs, you can hone in on which ones are the ones that are good weave certified. Not only does this tell our vendors and manufacturers that this is important to us and we need this as a tool as interior designers, um, but it also helps us more easily and more quickly uh, source uh, the, the kinds of products that we can feel good about. So again, a lot, a lot more to do, but I think at the end of the day, there's a real benefit to uh, sustainable style. You feel good about the work that you're doing and your clients will too. Um, you know, think about the kind of energy that you want to bring into a home of yours or your clients. If you thought for a moment that child labor went into the manufacturing of an item that you brought into a home, you have to ask yourself, is that something I want in my home? No matter what it looks like, can an item truly be beautiful if it holds that kind of energy? I don't think so. And I want you to realize that you don't have to sacrifice your margins or your profit to embrace sustainability. Making these choices is good business. And they not only can coexist, but embracing sustainability as a core value in your business can help align you with like-minded clients. So that's all I have for you today. Please head over to our website and get your free uh, sustainability guide for interior designers. Again, uh, this is a free printable guide. It has the key principles of sustainable interiors, terms to know, uh, eco labels and certifications to look for, as well as 10 favorite, 10 of my favorite brands that are dedicated to sustainability. So if you want to add these names to your Rolodex, you can do that. That's all I have for today. I will see you next week. Bye for now. Hey friend, thank you so much for letting me spend a part of this day with you. I'm so passionate about helping designers like you, and I believe in a rising tide that when one of us does well, we all do better. So if you share this attitude of abundance with me, I want you to do just one little thing. Please share this episode with someone you think might love it. 
And if you're feeling extra generous today, go ahead and take just 30 seconds to open your podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. It's free for you to do, and it helps me to be able to keep making more episodes and resources for you. However you choose to help, please know I appreciate you so very much. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you soon.